Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Idaho Public Television Endowment. You feel this sense of discovery and this Frankly, it's like an adrenaline rush when, when it happens. Coming up, a conversation with award-winning architect Jeannie Gang about her philosophy of building and her love of taking things apart. That's conversations from the Sun Valley Writers Conference on Dialogue next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. When you look at the built environment around you, do you have a sense of peace, excitement, boredom? Studies are increasingly showing that architecture can affect not only our mood, but even our health. What architects design becomes the landscape around us for centuries to come. Jeannie Gang is a Chicago architect who's won accolades for her innovative designs and materials, such as those used in her Aqua Tower in Chicago. Her Vista Tower, also in Chicago, will be the tallest building in the world designed by a woman-owned firm. The founder of Studio Gang, Jeannie is a member of the Selective American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also the recipient of the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship. She's also the author of several books, including Reveal and Reverse Effect. I spoke with Gang at the 2018 Sun Valley Writers Conference about why she wanted to become an architect, her architectural philosophy, why she likes to break things, and what keeps her up at night. What's the first building that you remember? Um, you know, honestly, I think I, that what sticks in my mind was coming out west as a kid on one of these trips and, and coming across, um, seeing the Grand Canyon as, you know, so more of a landscape, but then um, visiting Mesa Verde. My which, favorite national park. <laughs> yeah, it's, it really combines nature, um, geology and then how the inhabitants lived building right into the side of the cliffs and with the material from there so everything is really kind of blended in um, and you can just imagine what it be, would be like to live there and it just captured my imagination it was, it was so beautiful what made you want to be an architect to actually do this as a mm -hmm. as a living um, i think you know i was always very interested in mathematics and good at math and then and and artistic at the same time so it was like it's one of these professions that really combines a couple of my skills and so then I like um, I al always um, like to make things construct things with materials and um, that was my form of play growing up so building a tree house or a fort I remember building a fort out of ice because in Chicago area it was very cold and one, one winter we had an enormous amount of snow and um, my mom boiled hot water for me so that I could go out to the, the, the big mound of snow and start um, using the hot water to make tunnels and things through it so you know I think I spent a week on that <laughs> on that particular fort. When somebody who doesn't know that much about architecture asks you um, about your architectural philosophy or how you define yourself. How do you describe that? I, I'm one who views the practice of architecture with a more expansive lens. I, I like to have an impact on my community and with, with every project that I do, I try to see how it can have uh, amplify the impact of that, that new project. So if a client is you know, building a theater, you know, how can that theater um, participate in the uh, urban life of the, the place where it's being built, um, or if it's if it's a tall building, what happens outside the footprint of the tower? How does it meet the ground, and how does it connect to the neighbors? So I'm really interested in the connections between um, my buildings and the environment that they're in. Um, and I also really think that a lot of what I do is focused on improving kind of relationships between people that use the building. So I think a lot from the inside out you know, how can a building make it easier to have dialogue, or how can a building help you study, or how can a building um, help you connect to 
uh, different groups together in a more comfortable way. So I, I think that those, those kind of concerns start from the inside and then they uh, radiate outward toward the city. So using some examples, um, with Aqua Tower, you have these mm -hmm. balconies that are kind of staggered mm -hmm. and um, undulating, and that helps people um, see in a different way, not only from their balcony out, but also be able to interact with other people in the, in the building. So we wanted to have this kind of relationship on the exterior of the building, so people could step outside their apartment and maybe see other activity going on, not to be like in your face of you know, your neighbor, but the separation, but there's also a chance to see other people and not just feel like you're isolated in this tall tower. It's like being on a porch, you know, and that makes it more urban. Not to have, um, like a lot of towers do, just blinders on the tops and sides of the balconies so you don't see anyone ever, you know, that, that was, we, we thought, let's, let's push the boundaries here and make it feel more like part of the city. And, and you push the form, too, yeah. which is so intriguing. And, and I think you've, I've heard you describe it as almost like a topography, vertical yes. topography. So if we looked at, say, the Sun Valley area on a map with the topography lines, yeah. you've Lifted flipped up. that up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, so and there's kind of hills and valleys on the, on the facade that are, are these balconies uh, that, that go in and out. And so that's what makes it so that you're not you know, just seeing people directly, but just obliquely from floor to floor and it makes it just a more friendly building, I think. And I know there are those people that, that want to just be in a city and not see anyone ever, but I think where we need to move our, our cities is toward um, more community orientation. I think um, it, when, when you're isolated in a city, for one, it can cause lo loneliness, um, which is very common these days, and, and for two, you also don't, care, you lose a sense of empathy and care about other people. And to make a city really work, that needs to be one of the qualities. Um, we need to get more comfortable with being around other people and having comfortable and healthy relationships with people in our cities. And that's going to make it just better for everyone. And I've also um, heard you comment that we should fear no height, that, that increasingly as cities around the world get more and more crowded, we are going to have to build up more. Yes, um, I, I would say with the caveat that, you know, there are, his, there are places that should be low and, and I don't think it's right for every single city to just, you know, just start building skyscrapers. When things are that tall, um, do, you, do you have a fear of terrorism as we, as we know happened with the Trade Towers of, of a building being a target when it's really tall? Mm. It's in our conversations all the time about security and not only, that is probably the least likely thing Fire. to happen ever. But w what is more concerning is just making sure people, um, the, the, cell, the safety and welfare of the residents that are in there, that they can get out. I mean, in different places it's different. Like in California, I really need to protect against seismic activity. And so, the, and and f fire; those are big concerns in California that we don't really have in Chicago. So we have other concerns like ice, ice uh, falling off buildings. Um, it can be dangerous. So, so in every place that we build, we take into consideration all those things that need to be safe for the building. And one thing I find so intriguing is you you've been building a tall building on the High Line in New York City and you figured out that if you complied with the current zoning regulations it would cast a big shadow. And yeah. so you asked and got permission to kind of again change the flip it. <laughs> yeah, zoning. Um, yeah. And and so mm -hmm. that so that the building is looks yeah. very different but it will um, mean that more light stays on the yes, garden it, area. The thing about that project that, that's along the High Line on um, 40th, um, we called it Solar Carve Tower because it was the, the parts of the building are, are shaved off like on an angle to let sun into the, the High Line. And what, what, what we discovered on that project was just that all of the zoning for New York is set up for preserving light and air to the streets around, which is great. And you get this step back skyscraper. Um, but what we found, this, this was unusual to have the High Line Park, which is a, an elevated park 
um, on a former railroad, it runs through the middle of the block. So it's very, so the zoning really didn't take that into consideration. It was never a park, it was once a railroad. So people, so the volume of the building, the mass, would be right up against this railroad. But now it's a park, so it needs light. And it gave the building a really interesting design too, because it has these angles that you understand they're there for a reason, not just um, a whim, you know, they're there for the reason of making the public space better and making the space inside the building better. So. Do you choose your projects um, in part to try and work out some new thing, uh, so you know, a challenge like that? Um, I, yeah, now I, I feel so fortunate that we have more projects than we can do that come through the door, so we have to decide which ones to do. Um, and yes, I'm attracted to ones that, are, that have something that, that can maybe move the needle on, on an issue or a topic or a building type or a material so that there is a challenge involved. But, you know, frankly, I think any project could be, um, you can find those interesting parts of it, um, even if it looks very kind of normal, normative on the outside. Um, but I, I think what makes it interesting for me to work on it is, is to try to see how it can be done better and how can it be, how can innovation help this project to, you know, I'm really attracted to ones that, um, where it's like an organization that is trying to use design to reinvent themselves or to go into a new phase of their their purpose, their mission. Um, and then, you know, because then I feel like the design really needs to be supportive of that new phase that they're going into. Tell me about materials and your love of materials because um, again, some really interesting work in that area. Mm -hmm. um, and it isn't always necessarily for, for clients, but eventually the work can benefit a client. Mm -hmm. You do testing of materials yeah. in your office, which I think is really interesting. And maybe you could talk a little bit about um, the marble curtain, ah, which yeah. was displayed mm -hmm. at the uh, Building Museum, National Building Museum in Washington, D.C. And um, you came up with new... Uh, yeah. Insights about mm -hmm. masonry and stone. I, I, exhibitions are a good place to do tests, you know, experimental work as well. You don't want to like go do a, a client's building and experiment with new materials. So that's why we do things, you know, in, in different formats like exhibitions or maybe we're trying to weather a piece of material and see how it weathers and we'll put it on our rooftop for a couple years, you know, so we're doing or break things in, inside You of like our, to break things, don't you? Yes, I do. I think I learn more about things from breaking them than any other way, so, especially glass. I mean, like, glass breaks in a very interesting way. You know, it's the physics of those materials and how they, how they bend or break or fracture um, that tells you a lot about the material. So the marble curtain was really interesting. You were asked it was an exhibit on masonry, and you were asked to do something that you had never done before. Yeah, well, we were asked to use stone to, to exhibit, you know, what, what can be done with stone today, because I think the International Masonry Institute was really interested in, like, introducing these materials to, a, you know, next generation of architects, and what, what will they do with them? And so this is one of my early projects, and. Uh, um, I discovered that the floor of the museum could not support like big blocks of stone. Um, there was a crawl space under there and the, the joists would not support it. So it, it inspired me to think about a lightweight stone installation. So how thin can you get and, and ultimately like hanging it from the ceiling um, of the museum and putting the stone into tension, which is not something that stone is n normally asked to do. And so um, it, through just that simple prompt of trying to make a lightweight hanging stone structure, uh, we made so many discoveries and, and came up with a beautiful project. Can you tell me a little bit more about the moniker that you have for your firm, Actionable Idealism? Okay, yes. We have this idealistic 
side of ourselves and we want to make things better and change it for the best but we also want to do it fast and have things that are that are achievable in our lifetime but even faster than that in in a few years and so um it the, the phrase actual idealism kind of means that um we might start working on something before we even have a client or do some research on a, a topic that we think is important like the quality of the river water in in chicago and then um, we try to focus our projects and lincoln park zoo is another one that we chose because it, it, they wanted to improve this part of the city and in, improve the um, habitat restoration and we took that really far in improving the water quality there at the pond um, creating more biodiversity around the pond so that more um, different kinds of insects and birds and pollinators and even mammals, small mammals, can use that space. So what keeps you up at night? What, what are some of these big, big ticket items where you feel as an architect and as somebody who's a visual artist that you can help improve? I worry a lot that um, I want our, all of our projects to be as sustainable as possible and um, you know, making making a convincing art. More and more clients are asking us, you know, f to do sustainability, which is great. Uh, but, um, you know, I try to bring that as much as I can and get it into the budget and be as green as possible for all of our projects. But they're so beneficial because, like, in the long run, it really saves, saves money, saves energy, saves carbon. So, you know, those are things that I, I always try to get in the projects and um, um, try to protect in the projects. But, you know, it, it's always about finding the right balance of what the owner is willing to do and what they feel comfortable with and what's possible from the technology side and budget side. And so, yeah, you just have to marry those things together. Does being a woman mean you do anything differently or should people be focusing their attention that way? Well, you know, honestly, I don't even think about it myself. Well, like in, when I'm designing, I'm just designing. I'm trying to uh, use my creativity to toward a client's project and, you know, come up with great ideas. And, and my, my, my main um, exciting experience in design is whenever I make, or I, together with my team, are we find, we have a discovery, like, oh, if we place the organization's building this way, it's going to solve 10 problems at once. And, you know, it could be on any, it could be about the material, it could be about um, a form, it could be a, many different things. But you feel this sense of discovery and this Frankly, it's like an adrenaline rush when you, when it happens, <laughs> and you know that you got on something really good that's gonna make the project great, um, and so that that that's a really that thing. It doesn't have anything to do with whatsoever with being a woman. I don't think. I mean, I'm sure guys have it too, <laughs> but it, it, it's the most fun part. But you do design. take care that your office is not just male architects. I mean, there's a blend of, of um, different genders. And um, I know you've spent some attention taking a look at pay parity. Yeah. Well, honestly, I just hire people for their talent. Like, um, we have so many people trying to work with us, and they have resumes and experiences. And, and, and I interview every single person that we hire. Like, it could be via Skype or something remote. but. Because um, I want to meet the person that's going to work with me, and so um, it's just natural. I pick the best people, the best. I want the best talent, the best minds, the most energetic people that to come work with me, and it just happens to be that half of them are happen to be women. So it, I don't think there's any big trick to that. We are one of the fastest growing states in the country, Boise, Idaho one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We're growing out, not necessarily up, although there are some new apartment buildings going up in, in Boise. What's your sense about this trend? You know, not everyone wants to live in a skyscraper. Many people mm. want, you know, big backyard, double, triple garage, their own home. They want to spread out. 
um, as an architect and an urban yeah. planner type, what, what's your sense about that? Mm. Well, I'd just say be careful because, you know, transportation is changing very quickly. And, um, you know, we have clients that are asking us to, uh, you know, when, when we build a parking garage for a building, like to make it so that that parking garage can be converted into something else because we know that the future of driving is going to change completely. So um, when you're laying out a city and, and expanding it, it's very important to think about these things that, that are happening. And you might be building and spending way too much on big wide roads and, and all the infrastructure that, that, that takes, that goes way out, you know, beyond the city center. Um, it's a lot of money to, to invest in something that might be completely changing in a few years. You know, just the idea of having a, a, um, a continuous uh, driverless cars that don't need to, you don't need to actually own them because they're just available all the time or the shared, we see more and more a shared idea about transportation. Um, you just don't need to have that much space devoted to vehicles because they might just be driving around all the time and not um, having to park overnight in a big space. Or, and for that matter, I think um, the dimensioning of the roads, it, 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 they won't, you won't need to have six lanes in each direction, you know what I mean? So it's gonna be a lot more efficient and that is valuable space that, you know, when you, when you put that amount of spread in between neighborhoods, it, it ends up being a big divide and, and you can't walk anywhere and it, it ultimately decreases quality of life. So I would just say in, in planning and growing, and every city is growing, just planning it so that you get the city that you want ultimately and not just um, the easiest thing to do, which is just to you know, sprawl out and just keep going further and further and further and drive as far out until it becomes cheap enough. <laughs> because it's, it's That is what's happening is people can't afford the, the housing stock uh, in cities because it's still so, it's limited. Right. And so they're right. having to move further and further out because of cost. But cost, but that is a cost that you're, everybody's got to pay for those roads indefinitely. That infrastructure, that water line that keeps going out and out and out, that is everybody that lives in this, you know, this urban environment will be paying for that forever. So, so it's, I think there, maybe there's a way to to strategize, to incentivize more compact growth. So you also plan for the open spaces and make them really exciting and wonderful to be in, you know, and it's better to have a great designed park that's big and has lots of recreation than the green boundary around each house, which is not usable by anyone and you just have to mow it all the time. So, you know, frankly, a, an open space can be very iconic. If you have good design, good landscape architects, you actually do want your city to have more people in it because you get more benefits if you have more people. So the trick is just finding out how it can be comfortable and, and, and take advantage of, of more people living in the same smaller footprint. This uh, proposed this library building in uh -huh. Boise. There's a historic preservation controversy associated with it because there's oh. a an old log cabin on the site that's being used by the literary center, and people don't want to see it moved. You know, it may uh -huh. need to move to accommodate this this new structure. And you deal with this as well. Um, what's your sense about how to work out those type of mm. conundrums? Yeah. <clears throat> um. I don't know the details of, of that particular project, um, but I would say I think the best solutions come about when there's an open-mindedness to um, to the, the environment. Um, um, and of course, everything needs to be discussed and, and weighed, and people need a chance to chime in their thoughts. Um, but a lot of buildings, have been moved, frankly. You know, it's, it's nicer to think of being able to, to move it than to tear it down or n not have it at all or have, or have it underutilized in the space. What are you working on right now that's really exciting you? 
Um, oh, so much uh, that's happening right now. Um, um, one of my projects is a new wing on the American Museum of Natural History in New York, so that's really exciting. Um, I'm also working on in, in the middle of the country in Little Rock, an, an arts center, and then on, on also in um, California, in San Francisco, we're designing the um, new campus for the California College of the Arts, and so that's really exciting. Um, but there's just so much going on that it, it's really, you know, I, I really love what I do. I feel like I love going to work every day and, and working on these interesting projects and meeting all the people um, and trying to help communities and organizations move forward. It's, it's pretty fun, I have to say. Well, as we wrap up, if somebody um, were to come to you and say, well, why does architecture even matter? I mean, why should we care about it? Um, what would you say? The things that we build say something about us as a, as a culture. What you build and what you allow to be built is going to be your image. I mean, if you care about how you look and what you wear and, and, and the house you live in yourself, just extend that a little bit further and it, it is about, there's a care level of care about the environment that you create that represents you. Um, to the rest of the world, and so it is important. And you know, it doesn't have to be every building is a masterpiece. It just means that um, the city shapes how we behave too, as well. So if we make uh, a city that's full of solid, opaque buildings that don't connect to the sidewalk, then people aren't going to walk down the si sidewalk. So we, our behavior is shaped by our built environment. I really think so, and it's, it's clear that it's true. So um, it's important to take care of that, and, and, in, and it will be the rewards for having a good city center and, and built environment will be large because people want to you know, have a higher quality of life and they want to be here. So it, it definitely matters. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I know how sure. busy you are traveling all over the world. <laughs> so I really appreciate you taking the time to no. talk with me and by proxy our viewers. Oh, thank you for, so much for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. You've been listening to Architect Jeannie Gang. Our conversation was taped at the 2018 Sun Valley Writers Conference. My thanks to the organizers of that event for allowing us to interview some of their insightful speakers. For more information, including how to stream the more than 50 interviews we've conducted at the conference, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television, by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by the Idaho Public Television Endowment.